Hello and welcome to The Appetite, a podcast brought to you by Opal Food and Body Wisdom, an eating disorder treatment center in Seattle, Washington. The Appetite is all about issues of food, body, sport, and mental health. I'm your host, Carter Umhow, a therapist, artist, and writer. Today I'm talking to Gloria Lucas, founder of Nalgona Positivity Pride, which is a Chicana indigenous body positive organization that provides intersectional eating disorder education and support. Gloria has lectured across the country and internationally and been featured in publications such as Me Too, NPR, Bitch Magazine, Huffington Post, Remezcla, Cosmopolitan, Latina, and Bustle. She also has a vibrant and large community of followers online, particularly on Instagram, at Nalgona Positivity Pride. Gloria's work serves to uncover the impacts of historical trauma on the relationship people of color and peoples of indigenous descent have with food and their bodies. Today, she joins us to share about her incredible work through Nalgona Positivity Pride and parts of her personal story. Before we start, though, please know that Gloria is coming to Seattle and will be giving a lecture at Opal on August 9th called Historical Trauma and Modern Day Oppression. How does this relate to eating disorders? If you find yourself already intrigued, feel free to just pause this podcast right here and go buy a ticket because they're going very fast and you won't want to miss it. Otherwise, she will also be staying in Seattle the next day and doing a pop-up with Chica's Roadshow at Cube's Baking Co. in Wallingford on 45th Street. So basically just down the road from Opal. Um, We know that most of our listeners um, are in the Pacific Northwest area, but so many of you are not. So if you are outside of Washington, uh, make sure you check out her website to see if she's coming to a city near you. All right. So with no further ado, let's talk to Gloria. Hi, Gloria. Welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. Yes, it's so good to have you. I'd love for you to just let us know first just a little bit about the work that you do and introduce yourself. Yeah, so I started Nalgona Positivity Pride about five years ago out of a need to really bring our stories forward because I didn't hear them before, you know, so uh, it was in response to that that I started Nalgona Positivity Pride and Before that, I I was a sexual health educator, had a background within like HIV work and other nonprofit work. But yes, I've been doing this for five years. Can you describe a little bit about what Nalgona Positivity Pride is? Yes. So Nalgona Positivity Pride is a body positive organization with Chicana roots that focuses on creating a platform for BIPOC, which means Black, Indigenous, and people of color with eating disorders. We focus on education, so I connect the link between eating disorders and historical trauma. So I'm very fortunate that I get to travel across the country and also internationally and present in different community settings. We also have a large social media platform where, you know, we try to, in, in other words, disrupt, right, and to create our own opportunities of of representation. We also have an online free monthly peer support group for BIPOC folks with eating disorders. And we also host community events throughout the year to continue raising awareness. Wow, that is so much that you all offer. Can you tell us a little bit about how your own personal and professional journey led you into the creation of this? Yeah, so I grew up in Southern California in the Inland Empire, which is an hour south of Los Angeles. And, you know, where I was at, I was at the right place, right time. Um, There was a DIY do-it-yourself punk community that really influenced me, right, and and taught me the importance of being self-reliant and the fact that there's many ways to to do things, right? That there's not just one official way. And so having this background of, you know, punk music as well as DIY nurtured my ability to to not ask for permission to do whatever it is that I wanted to do. You know, I was always a feminist before I knew there was a term for it, right? Like I had always felt it. So I started organizing around women of color and, 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 and feminism when I was 17. And then I became a sexual health educator, so I became comfortable with speaking in large groups and speaking about topics that were sensitive, you know, and and speaking about it in different 
cultures as well. So having these skills really made it easy for me. I wouldn't say easy, but facilitated not going on positivity pride, right? And and one of the things I always mention about my line of work is that I really didn't have any models to follow with not going on positivity pride. Like there's nothing I could compare it to. So many times, and even to this day, like I didn't know what I was doing, right? So it was just like, I this feels right, so I'm going to go for it. And it was never like a clear five-year plan or one-year plan or any of that. It just was all intuitive and one step at a time. And I never thought MPP would be what it is today or that it would become like my career and my full-time work. Like I, I never thought that. And like, you know, another thing that I mentioned is that I don't have a college education and I don't say that as, as like a bad thing for me, you know, having been brought up in the DIY and the punk world, like it really made me stronger in that sense that like I, I could be whatever it is that I wanted to be. And that again, I don't have to ask for permission. Wow. Right. That's such a powerful, powerful place to start. Where did eating disorders come into your work? Well, since I was 10, I struggled with an eating disorder. And, you know, I think everybody noticed, but yet there was like no language for it. You know, I grew up in a, my parents are immigrants and bicultural and and my parents speak Spanish. So that definitely was a barrier to proper education around eating disorders. And so I struggled and I never saw anybody that looked like me or talk like me, right? Talk about eating disorders. So that lack of representation like really made my eating disorder worse, right? Because there was nothing to reflect back at what I had. And many times like my eating disorder was not even questioned within myself. Like it was just part of my day. And ultimately, you know, the eating disorder ended up taking control of all of my life. And I had a very vacant life. And so I decided to get better. And that moment when I decided to get better, I couldn't get time off work, right? I couldn't because I I had to work, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't have that opportunity. So ultimately, like my eating disorder recovery at that time was mainly by myself, on top of like maybe like Overeaters Anonymous and, you know, but then again, going to those groups, you know, it it was many times a miss because I was the youngest or the only person of color wow. in there. And again, like I'm not in no way encouraging people to do their recovery on, on their own because it's very dangerous and it's painful. And that's the reality of for a lot of low income people, as well as people of color is that there aren't resources for us. And, you know, while growing up, like I would see shows and movies of white girls with eating disorders who who were reluctant to get help, but yet they had like this overflowing support and resources. Mm. And but again, that was not my case at all, at all. And on top of that, like my friends and family not knowing what to do or how to help me, right, or how to ask about it. So having experienced all of this, like really encouraged me to to, to talk about it and to do something about it. And with my feminist organizing skills, I, I was able to do that. What did you do to start offering different spaces initially for people of color? Well, I think it started first with hosting discussions and events. And then I started to learn more and more about historical trauma. And when it finally, like, everything connected for me in a personal level, I knew that I had to go out there and speak about it, like mm-hmm. do my presentation on it. And I did that. I looked for different community like spaces. Mm-hmm. And then I told them, can I go and speak about this? And then I remember I contacted a school. I had a friend who worked for the, I think it was the gender and, and sexuality like department, studies department. And I asked them like, can I go present? And then they asked me, like, how much would you like to get paid? And I was like, I could get paid for this? (laughs) (laughs) What a good thing. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. I was like, oh, okay. I want to get paid for this. Yeah, that's a turning point. Yeah, yeah. And then um, 
then the t-shirts came the etsy came and it's like yeah that it just grew, grew little by little so yeah. Gloria, i really want to know more about the work that you have done personally and professionally around historical trauma and how you might explain what that is, first of all, and then what that means in terms of eating disorders. I think like historical trauma is a very complex conversation, right? And I think that even for myself, like it took a very long time for me to somewhat grasp and to understand. It's important to acknowledge that for a lot of folks we've been like conditioned to dismiss certain experiences just by how this country was founded, right? And it makes it hard sometimes to, to grasp. But, you know, historical trauma is a cumulative emotional harm over generations. Get this trauma that gets passed down through learned behavior, through the environment, and also on the cellular level, you know, when we think about 500 years of extreme violence. I mean, we're speaking about a violence that we have never really witnessed, right? The way that it, it killed many indigenous peoples, right? And, and the ongoing deprivations of black and indigenous people today, North and South America, right? Um, there is no way that we could separate these factors to body image and the relationship these groups have with food. Like we just cannot separate those two, yeah. right? course. As well, you know, food control and starvation were at the center of white colonialism. For instance, like food rations were controlled by white officials as a way to have indigenous groups sign treaties or as a form of punishment, right, for those that engage in culturally related uh, practices. Also, like, you know, looking at how starvation studies were conducted on First Nations children, in residential schools. Also, the shaming and banning of indigenous foods as a means of cultural genocide, right? Because if we look at many, like indigenous groups, in general, many of them, the sense of self, the thought and the universe was deeply connected to, to the land, right? So much so that in some indigenous languages, there's no translation to saying things such as my plant, or my land, right? Because they were all in one. You know, the displacement that took place in order to make more room for white settlers, right? It was violent dislocations, right? It, it, it robbed people from their native lands and it caused this disruption and a disconnection with the land and therefore the self, as well as the local foods, right? Like, and again, like looking at like my own linear background. You know, uh, my father speaks Nahuatl, and so we come from the Mexica. And in the Mexica spirituality realm, we come from corn. Like, mm. all of humanity started because of corn. And, like, let's look at how corn and GMO is, like, all of that is, is being, it's taking place right now, something that was so sacred to now being genetically modified. It just, it's a clear representation of how, indigenous foods have been treated on top of like looking at the superfood craze and all of these things, right? Foods that were once shamed and banned from indigenous people consuming or doing ceremony with only for years later, hundreds of years later, for, for white people and white corporations to use as a means for like self-discovery and profit. Again, there's so many levels of inequality. There's no way that, you know, indigenous descent people can witness this and not have a physical reaction, right? And physical reaction that can lead to other types of health issues, right? So all these factors combined from the past to the current sociopolitical inequality, like make it very hard for black and indigenous people, as well as indigenous descent communities to experience peace with food. So for a lot of us, it goes beyond of I don't like how I look to more like I'm exhausted of such painful colonial driven like circumstances, right? And so we cannot erase the damage that has been done and uh, that has contributed to today's mistreatment of people of color and indigenous people, especially when 
you know, in many cases, there's no acknowledgement of what has been done and no reparations whatsoever, right? Yes, it's it's overwhelming to think about that. And I, my, my heart right now is thinking, having been someone that's worked in the eating disorder treatment world, how little of that is ever even mentioned. It's horrifying and, and humbling to think about. And it makes me curious, as you've done such amazing work around this and likely looked back on your own experience with an eating disorder, do you see spaces where the kind of treatment experience could be vastly different? Yes. I don't think there's one clinic that I'm aware of that the center of it all has been people of color or indigenous people. Like, I, I don't know that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know of such clinic or effort for the last 30 plus years. Like this whole myth of eating disorders only affecting white middle class women has really damaged, you know, um, research and as well as the communities outside of this group experiencing eating disorders. I I feel like it's important to also look beyond like treatment centers and treatment models and look more at like, like if we truly want indigenous descent people to heal their relationship with food, and if we truly care about the environment, that means we have to give the land back. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like we need to go like, Beyond that, yes, and like it's a little bit more extreme because what happened was is extreme. So that means we need extreme measures to make it right. I know for some people this is a whole lot, right, or it's too much or or whatnot. But what Indigenous people have experienced has been too much. <laughs> yes. So I think it is important to look even beyond like treatment and look more at community and and look more at. Who are the groups of people that are working inside communities, outside of treatment models? Because the reality is that the majority of us will never set foot in a treatment center. It's just not accessible. Like, I posted about this a few months ago. Like, you know, I've dedicated five years of my life. I've worked myself to sickness, you know, providing visibility and even providing education for providers. But yet, even though I've been a resource for the eating disorder world, I still myself cannot access treatment. Jeez. Like, I'm very well aware of that, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and so again, like there just needs to be a complete shift. And this is not to discredit what treatment centers have done and, and do because it is important and, and it has provided a source of help for many. But I think that we could do better And I feel that whenever we do have these conversations, especially with people who have been part of the eating disorder world for a very long time, like they feel very threatened. And I think that that's tied to power. And I think it's tied to to, to white supremacy because let's face it, like the eating disorder world is predominantly white. Right. Yeah, I think we need to have these very difficult conversations and learn to be uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As we're talking right now, Gloria, I'm just thinking about all that I don't know and really wanting to be able to center the the spaces where you know so much more than me. So like I have my questions that I sent you and I'm like, hmm, well, I wonder where your energy is as we talk about this right now and if that could be a way that we move forward in the conversation. Hmm. I, I will say that within the last like two or three years, like I have seen people in the eating disorder world like be more receptive and actually start asking questions and wanting this change, you know, and I think that that's very important. And I feel like I'm doing this at the right moment, like versus if I would have been doing this in the eighties, like yeah, really different <laughs> environment. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Like it's, it's very different. Like it's important to encourage people to be curious and to accept the fact that a lot of this is uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. For those folks who have maybe more privilege, like it does not compare to what people of color like experience every day. So the fact that they get to experience it just like right now, again, it just shows how important this line of work is and the importance of staying open and also, again, like doing a lot of listening even when we don't quite understand it or like have a reaction towards it. It's like, no, stay with it. Like, sleep on it, Mm -hmm. 
let it marinate. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that that's kind of also like my own, like where I'm at, like as well, like listening to other people's struggles, because I don't know what it's like to be transgender. I don't know what it's like to be black. I don't know what it's like to have a physical disability. Like, I, I don't know what these things are. And I cannot speak for them, but what I can do is listen. What I can do is go out of my way to learn more about these things. Even so, when these other marginalized groups express themselves in the way that is angry, Mm -hmm. I have to listen, you know? And I think that many times people today want to only listen when it's nice and sweet. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't think that's right because sometimes the best learning takes place when there's heavy emotions involved like that's when I've done the most learning when I've messed up or yeah when somebody's just like angry like I I learned a lot I I just would like to mention that for anybody that's listening is that that it's okay when other marginalized groups express themselves in an angry way yes yes and it also is is part of the work to be able to actually say how big and horrible the trauma is. And so for there to be no space for that to be received would be, again, a re-traumatization over and over and over again if there's no space for the person of color to actually talk about their story. Yeah. That's enraging. I I would love to get a little bit more into the specifics of your own story if you feel open to that. Yeah. Because it sounds like you had your eating disorder through your life, like you said, it was just a normal part of your day. And then you started moving into more and more work and recovery in that through all the difficulties that were there. And then it sounds like you became more and more aware of the historical trauma that was at play. How do you see that historical trauma having manifested for you in your eating disorder? Yeah, I mean, I think that looking at like my own family history, how it was a lot of starvation and like, and also a lot of other things that I don't know what happened, mm-hmm. right? Because part of, particularly for those that come from Latin America, there's a lot, there was a lot of erasure. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm Mexican, right? I'm, I have Mexican indigenous descent. But one of the common things that I noticed is the fact that one of the ways that our people were able to survive was through ignoring and not addressing feelings and not talking about it. And I think that there's so many stories that I don't know. I don't know, right? And looking at the fact that I am the first generation that does not speak Nahuatl, right? Like that erasure. So like this sense of food insecurity was a part of me since I was a kid. Like, you know, and I didn't grow up in a home where I went to bed hungry, but yet I always had this feeling of like, I don't know when I'm going to eat again. So I need to eat like a lot. And and in my lifetime, like there was always food around, but yet I always had these feelings. So that tells me by not only the starvation that my mother experienced, but what more is there that I don't know and was purposely forgotten, like in order to survive, in order to make it through years of, of colonialism, right? And, you know, where where I'm at right now is I'm relapsing from my eating disorder after years of being okay, you know, and I think that it's important for me to say that because I always want to present myself authentically and I feel that eating disorders thrive in isolation and in secrecy. And I find that not everybody is transparent about these things who are in this line of work. And I think that that's a disservice for everybody. And I also realize that, you know, for many of us, with limited resources, like our eating disorders are going to be part of us forever for the rest of our lives. And I, that's how I feel about it for myself. Mm. And I think it's very difficult to ask people, indigenous people, descent people to be recovered mm. when we continue to see the environment, like this native land be, be abused. Right. And I, and I, and I think this connects back to like how, for indigenous people, like the self was tied, it was tied to the land, right? It was a representation, it was a reflection of oneself. So to see the land be abused with these pipelines, with like the environmental degradations and so forth, like it's very difficult to then expect indigenous to send people to heal from their, from the relationship with food. So with that, like, 
you know, being very open about it and open about it with everybody. Like I will tell the donut man in the corner, like <laughs> I, <laughs> you know, like I have an eating because for me it's important to make like we need to talk about this, right? Mm-hmm. Like right now I'm dating and I just one of the things I mentioned to them. I don't care if they think I have too much baggage. It's just like no. Like, men, you also need to have these conversations about eating disorders. Because if I'm one of the very few saying it out loud, then we could only imagine how many more are struggling with this, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, I'm just in a very weird state right now with my relationship with food because I find that there's a lot of dualities happening in my life. And I think that the eating disorder world really placed this idea in my mind of, like, you're either recovered or not recovered, like, period. Right. And if you're not recovered, then you must pause, step back and get the help you need and then come back recovered. But I'm like, that does not exist for me. Mm -hmm. You know, also, like one of the things that's really been on my mind lately is the importance of talking about harm reduction within eating disorders. Like, how do we meet people who don't want to recover from their eating disorders? Because that was me at one point. So how do we then meet these people where they're at? where we encourage them to do less harm, right, to their bodies, right, and to their teeth or to their stomachs. And, like, you know, so, like, how do like how do we engage in this conversation to provide education? Because I know when I was at my worst with my eating disorder, there could have been things shared to me that would have helped me, like yeah. not my, with my teeth or, or with my stomach and all these other things, right? And I think that that's, something that we don't really have in the eating disorder world because everything is about getting recovered ASAP, but that's not always where our clients might be, right? Or, or where people are at. I feel so moved by you saying that. I was a little tearful over here as you were talking about that. You know, at Opal, we definitely want to present the idea of recovery out of a place of hope and offering that as a possibility. But the way that you're putting it, I feel like it creates more space in me to think about it that way. And it feels like it actually resonates in a way that really honors the complexity of experience. And as you put it, if you are watching the land in front of you continue to be destroyed and taken further and further away from your people, like you're watching continued harm happen. And so there's not necessarily some beautiful conclusion that you are able to rest into as you pursue recovery. The trauma is not over. And so to think about um, your eating disorder continuing to manifest at particular seasons in your life, that makes sense to me. And it feels like such a gracious attitude towards yourself and to the complexity of the process. So I I appreciate that so much. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. 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 These are difficult conversations. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I appreciate your bravery around it and bringing that for sure. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so what would you, what would you say to people that are looking forward to a different kind of engagement with themselves or a different kind of healing? I, I would want to tell folks that are struggling, right. Particularly with, with again, people who are in similar shoes of like limited resources and, maybe at, at a really bad state with, with an eating disorder that it it can get better. You know, me being a person that's had it for a very long time, that you can get to a better place. And then not to forget that we are a product of resiliency at the end of the day. Like we are very resilient people and that that's also been passed down. So it just hasn't been the trauma and the chaos that has been passed on, but also those resilient abilities. And we forget to celebrate and honor that. And I think that we have to remember that we're not alone with this, like that, that there's other people struggling and like, depending on like the type of spirituality that people have, right? Like, like we have ancestors around us all the time that help us, especially when we are open to that. So yeah, that we're not alone. And the importance of not beating oneself up because one is struggling because it doesn't help us. And I think that our, like our ancestors know that it's rough, Mm. that it's difficult. 
and that many times all that we have is harm reduction, and that's okay. That's completely fine. And I think that's one of the best things that I learned about myself with, within this journey is is that I can choose to do less harm with myself and that that's valid and that that's good enough. So, yeah, so it's just like don't beat yourself up because it doesn't do anything at the end of the day. And so, yeah, that, that's what I, I would say to other folks like that are struggling. I love that. I was just thinking uh, a couple things. Um, one is that your Instagram is, and and your presence on the internet is so beautiful and bright. I think that that is something that, you know, p- if people haven't been aware of who you are before or seen the Nalgona Positivity Pride Instagram or website, like the vibrancy that's there is huge. I, it's stunning. Um, and that struck me every time that I've ever seen or even gone to your Instagram feed. There's there's such a vibrancy. And I feel like that speaks to the kind of life and resiliency that you're speaking to as well, that you're dealing with really dark topics and you are bringing such a vitality into it and such a pride. And it's it's stunning. It's really stunning. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, before we end, I would love for people to get a little bit more of a sense of kind of how to keep in touch with you, how to support you as well, and maybe where to find you um, at different events coming up. Can you let us know a little bit about what's going on in your world? Yes. So I'm going to be touring <laughs> this cool. summer. Um, <laughs> Different um, places, and one of them is Seattle. I will be in Seattle doing one of my my historical trauma and eating disorders talk on August ninth, right? Ninth, I think it's yeah. August ninth, <laughs> <laughs> and that's at August Opal, noon. right? Yes, and that will take place at Opal, who is one of our sponsors. And then I will be doing a pop up the following day at Cube's Banking Company there in Seattle from 12 to 4 p.m. So I will be in Seattle as well as um, Portland. I will be in Albuquerque, Denver, Chicago, and maybe Arizona. Yeah, you are on a tour. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Wow. Well, I I hope that I'll be able to see you somewhere. Um, And if not, I hope that all of our listeners can come find you um, if they are nearby or want to take a road trip. (laughs) Um, I can't imagine you'd be worth driving for. So for those that are listening and that are interested in Gloria's um, lectures coming up and and events, please make sure that you check out the um, description and the show notes on, in your podcast app to learn a little bit more about that and see some links so you can buy some tickets um, to her event at Opal and learn more about the pop-up here in Seattle. Um, yeah. Gloria, it's been so wonderful to get to talk to you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story and your expertise with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. To support Gloria's work, consider making a one-time donation or become a Patreon. Links will be included in the show notes, but can also be found on her site. Otherwise, make sure that you just stay connected to her because like I've said already a couple times, she's pretty incredible and her online community is gorgeous. Um, Even just being able to swipe through some of her photos on Instagram, I promise you will add something to your life. So find her there at Nalgona Positivity Pride. And if you want to learn more about Opal and Opal's resources, make sure to go to opalfoodandbody.com or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Thank you so much to Jack Straw Cultural Center for sound engineering, to Aaron Davidson for the Appetite's original music, and to Hans Anderson for editing. Please join us next time. Bye.